Conspiracies of the Church. These are some of the stories that the Church doesn't want you to know about. Stories like the origin of Satan, the original apocalypse, and the fable of Pandora's box. So grab a snack and get comfortable, and let's get into it. The Anunnaki and the Old Testament. The Old Testament's book of Genesis might not be what you think it is. There's the school of thought that points to the book of Genesis being a story about space aliens, human slavery, and some seriously weird stuff. The theory is that Genesis isn't speaking plainly. The story of God creating man and putting him in the Garden of Eden is about the Anunnaki creating humans and placing them in Mesopotamia to mine for gold. It might sound outrageous, but the Bible is pretty outrageous if you take it literally. Let's compare the story of Adam, Eve, and the Nephilim to the myth of the Anunnaki. Adam was created in the image of God, which would suggest that God was a human being. Or if humans were created by aliens, it would mean that aliens look exactly like us. We would never know if aliens are among us because they created us in their own image. That means they are indistinguishable from you, me, and your neighbor's grandma. Next, Eve was tempted to eat from the Tree of Knowledge. But it's possible that the story isn't about Eve's temptation. Instead, it could be about the temptation of the alien gods. After they created Adam and Eve, aka the first batch of humans in their own image, they were stuck with a conundrum. They weren't sure whether they should give their creations access to their incredible intelligence or leave them as dumb, primal versions of themselves. When Eve reached for the knowledge of God, she and Adam were banished from the Garden. Or in other words, the Anunnaki denied humans access to their cosmic wisdom. Are you following me up to this point? Does it make sense to you yet? Even if it's not 100% true, you have to admit that there's some logic here. After the expulsion of Adam and Eve, the Bible says that God sent angels from heaven to watch over them. Adam and Eve made babies, and those babies made more babies, and soon there were lots of humans running around. But the angels sent to watch them were naughty. They started breeding with humans, creating a race of hybrids. In the Bible, the hybrids are known as Nephilim. They are described in the Holy Book as giants that were monstrosities in the eyes of God. Following the Anunnaki theory, in reality, the Nephilim were hybrid human aliens. But if humans were made in the image of aliens, what was the big deal? The issue was that humans were created to look like Anunnaki but weren't given the same powers. Humans were deprived of the ultimate knowledge. They weren't allowed to use technology and were forced to be slaves. When the Anunnaki started inbreeding with their slaves, whom they viewed as lesser beings, things got complicated. Suddenly, there was a rising population of human Anunnaki hybrids. They looked the same but were genetically superior to normal humans because they had Anunnaki levels of intelligence. In the Book of Enoch, it explains that the Nephilim taught human beings how to wage war, how to practice magic, and how to do things that only the angels knew about. This can easily be interpreted as the hybrids teaching normal humans the way of their Anunnaki slave masters. Normal humans were given advanced weapons and learned how to use Anunnaki tech. So, naturally, this led to dissension and war. The ordinary humans didn't want to work anymore, and the hybrids sided with their half-human brethren. The full-blood Anunnaki were annoyed with the whole situation, and that's when they decided to kill everyone with a giant flood. About 12,000 years ago, according to both the Bible and physical proof, there was a flood. Directly after the deluge, primitive civilization started to appear around the globe. Were these civilizations, our very ancestors, the survivors of the Anunnaki's attempt to destroy humanity? Are you and I descendants of hybrids, aka Nephilim? Or are we the basic form of humans, abandoned on this planet by the Anunnaki after the Flood? The Faces of Satan Satan, Lord of Darkness, the Devil, the Corrupter, the Father of All Lies, the Big Red Guy with the Pitchfork, Whatever you want to call him, he has an exceptionally interesting history. Did you know that Satan didn't make his debut in Christian art until the 6th century AD? And when he did appear in Christian art, he was depicted as a benevolent angel. What the church doesn't want you to know is that they made up most things about the devil. When exploring the real history of Satan, it starts to become abundantly clear that he's not much more than a villainous cartoon character. That very first depiction I just mentioned, it can be found in the church of St. Apollinarius in Ravenna. Within the church is a Byzantine mosaic from 520 AD. The mosaic depicts a scene from the Gospel of Matthew known as the parable of the sheep and goats. In the picture is Jesus Christ, with his face looking as smooth as a baby's bottom. In early Christianity, Jesus didn't have a beard. The rugged, bearded Jesus Christ didn't appear until much more recently. In the mosaic, Jesus is wearing a purple robe 
robe and has a halo around his head. On his right hand side is an angel with red wings and a red robe. No, this one isn't Satan. The angel with the red wings is the Archangel Michael. On Jesus' left side is an angel dressed in blue garb, sporting some fashionable blue wings. It's the blue angel that's the devil. Although Satan is depicted in the mosaic as entirely angelic, there was another version of the character already being created. In the Dark Ages, artists started combining features of pagan beasts with the idea of Satan to create an image of the devil more similar to the one people are familiar with today. The devil was given hooves like a goat, horns like a goat, and shaggy fur like a goat. Do you know who else has goatish features? Pan from Greek mythology. This version of the devil was entirely based on the Greco-Roman god of nature. The devil also started to be depicted as a great dragon or as a scaly sea monster. This representation came from Nordic myths. Then, as the Dark Ages gave way to the Middle Ages, Satan was depicted in dozens of different ways. He was a beast, a dragon, a goat, a pig, and a reptile. Artists went nuts painting the many faces of the devil. I guess what I'm trying to get through to you is that the devil as an impish creature with leathery wings is a total fabrication of Christian artists. Most of his features were even stolen from much older religions. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Satan has hooves. The 42 Principles of Ma'at Can you list the Ten Commandments off the top of your head? Give it a shot and see how many you get. You likely got a few right, like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, and thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. If you got them all, I'm impressed. The other commandments include, thou shall have no other gods before me, thou shall make no idols, and thou shall not take the name of thy Lord your God in vain. Then there's keep the Sabbath day holy, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not covet, and thou Thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It's a lot to remember, don't you think? So many rules, and if you break one of them, you're going straight to hell. Now try to imagine how the Egyptians felt trying to remember the 42 principles of Ma'at. Wait, the 42 principles? Yes, the Egyptians had 42 of their own commandments that were handed down from the goddess Ma'at. Didn't you know the Ten Commandments were totally ripped off from the Egyptians? Ma'at isn't the most well-known goddess these days. Everyone's familiar with us. Cyrus, Anubis, and Horus, maybe even the cat goddess Bastet. But Maat is seriously underrated. Hopefully after this video, more people will know her name. She was the Egyptian goddess of truth, order, and balance. Her name was a literal translation of the Egyptian word, truth. It was believed that without Maat's existence, the universe would devolve into chaos and disorder. Maat was represented as a young woman, which was highly unusual for the Egyptians. Most of their gods and goddesses were depicted as part human and part animal. But Maat was 100% woman, although if I'm being honest, sometimes she was painted with wings sprouting underneath her arms. She was so important that legendary queen Hatshepsut built a temple in her honor at Karnak. Part of her mythology involved her 42 principles. The goddess gave these principles to the Egyptians so that they would live their lives with honor and truth. The point of the principles was that they would act as vital rules to keep Egyptians good and just, respecting their families, their environment, their gods, and their country. I won't list all 42 of them because I don't want to put you to sleep reading off the long list, but I will give you a few that you might find a little familiar. Keep in mind that the principles were written a little differently than the commandments in the Bible. They're known as negative confessions. Listen to the list and you'll understand why. I have not stolen. I have not committed adultery. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not cursed the gods. All ten of the commandments that were given to the Israelites after they left Egypt can be found in the 42 principles of Maat. Could such a thing be a coincidence? Many scholars believe that Judaism originated in Egypt with the Old Testament plagiarizing old Egyptian texts. Doesn't it seem like there could be some truth to this theory? And now for number 10. But first, I wanted to give a big shout out to Edwin Pina and Candice Perry. Thanks so much for watching and supporting OE. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Jesus and Dionysus. I may have tainted the rest of the video by bringing up the Anunnaki connection so early, but please bear with me here. Don't let the knowledge that you could be an alien and that your entire reality is questionable get to you too much. Jesus Christ was an imitation of the Greek god Dionysus. This is what Brian Murarescu recently suggested in his book on the subject. Brian argued in his book that the parallels between Dionysus and Jesus are so compelling 
that you can't deny they were the same character. Have you ever wondered why the Greeks threw away thousands of years of gods and goddesses to worship Jesus? If so, you aren't the only one. What could have motivated the Greeks to give up Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Aphrodite, Apollo, and all the others for Jesus? One theory is that it didn't happen in the way most people think. Christianity arrived in Greece around the year 49 AD, but it was likely much more mystical when it got there. The Greeks wouldn't have accepted a random prophet from Israel as their new god. Instead, Jesus would have had to be mixed with features from normal Greek gods so that they had an easier time digesting the change. Think of it like swallowing cough syrup with a spoonful of jam. To allow Christianity to spread, Jesus was made into an imitation of Dionysus. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and a virgin named Semele. Jesus was the son of God and Mary a virgin. Dionysus was the god of wine and ecstasy. Each year on January 5th, Dionysus performed the miracle of turning water into wine. The same miracle was performed by Jesus in the Gospel of John. The only difference is that Jesus performed his miracle on January 6th. There are many gods from ancient religions that have similarities with Jesus. The honest truth is that plenty of gods from across the world shared similarities with one another. Almost all religions had at least one god associated with the winter solstice, wine, a virgin birth, and resurrection. And just so you know, I'm not lying, here's a great big list of them. In Japan, Amaratasu was the goddess of the sun who slept in a cold cave until awoken once a year to be reborn at the winter solstice. When she emerged from her cave, sunlight was returned to the universe. In Viking mythology, Baldur is the closest character to Jesus. He was killed by his twin brother Hodder, who was tricked by Loki. But after his accidental murder, Baldur was resurrected. The Celtic tribes of ancient Scotland worshipped Bera, the Queen of Winter. In Egypt, Horus was the solar deity associated with resurrection and the winter solstice. Even the Hopi Indians celebrated the winter solstice and the goddess known only as the Spider Woman. Zoroastrianism and the Apocalypse Part 1 The idea of an apocalypse is far older than the Bible. The belief that good will ultimately triumph over the forces of evil seems to be eternal. Even so, the Bible's idea of the apocalypse may have been largely plagiarized from a religion that's way older than Christianity. Zoroastrianism is still very much alive and well in the world. The ancient Iranian religion is believed to be one of the oldest organized faith systems ever conceived by a human mind. Its similarities to Christianity are downright shocking. Much like how Christianity was established by Jesus, who was the prophet and the messiah, Zoroastrianism was established by Zoroaster. He was a Persian prophet who lived at some point around 3,500 years ago, though there's no exact date. Zoroaster preached that there was one true god, and that the god's name was Ahura Mazda. Yes, Mazda is spelled exactly the same as the car brand. Ahura Mazda was the creator of all things, the same as the Christian god. The religion strongly enforced the idea that life was a struggle between good and evil. Only those who had good thoughts, spoke good words, and completed good deeds would be freed from the forces of darkness, which were led by Angra Menu. Angra Menu was the Zoroastrian version of Satan. You can already see the parallels between the two religions. Zoroastrianism became the official religion of the Persian Empire in 550 BC. It continued to be practiced up until the Prophet Muhammad launched the Arab invasion of 651 AD. From that moment onward, Zoroastrians were persecuted and their religious sites were destroyed. The Zoroastrian faith was nearly wiped out completely. Only a few people still practice the religion, mostly in Iran and India. Zoroastrians and Christians are still waiting for their own apocalypse. In the ancient Persian religion, the end of times is known as Frashokareti. When it happens, evil will be destroyed and the sinners will be obliterated. Quite literally. Keep watching because the unimaginable details of Frashokareti are coming up soon. Shamhat and Enkidu The Epic of Gilgamesh is far older than the Bible, an epic book written in the Third Dynasty of Ur. It's a collection of Sumerian poems that's 4100 years old. It also happens to contain many original stories from the Bible. The Epic of Gilgamesh has the original flood myth in it, written long before Judaism even existed. The book is incredibly complicated. Trying to give you all the details of the Epic of Gilgamesh would be like trying to detail the entire Bible. Now I want to focus on one character in the book by the name of Shamhat. Shamhat was something known as a haremtu. In English, it means sacred temple prostitute. She was incredibly beautiful, which was why Shamhat was chosen to tame a wild man who was created by the gods. The gods had created a man named Enkidu 
but he was so savage that he was more ape than human. Shamhat was asked to seduce Enkidu and take the wilderness out of him. It was her duty to civilize Enkidu through sacred lovemaking. It seems like the Sumerians were quite literal when it came to that sort of thing. Fragments of this ancient story were discovered by archaeologists in 2015. The text said that Shamhat and Enkidu went at it for two weeks straight. They did it for so long that when they were done, Enkidu was a perfectly civilized human. Now a gentleman of refined tastes, Enkidu left the wilderness behind. He rejected his life as a savage and became best friends with Gilgamesh. Shamahat's story might not sound like anything you're familiar with in the Bible, but if you look a little closer, you'll notice the similarities between Enkidu and Shamhat and Adam and Eve. Adam and Enkidu were both wild men created by gods. Each one was tempered by the arrival of a woman and became civilized through her touch. Enkidu and Shamhat left the wilds to join civilization. And as you know, Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. Number 6. Mary Magdalene and the Merovingians the Vatican tried to kill Jesus Christ's descendants. That's the myth behind Dagobert, Mary Magdalene, and the Merovingian bloodline. But is it true? This myth will take us through many centuries, so you're going to need to stay on your toes. In the first century AD, Mary Magdalene, also known as Mary of Magdala, was the leader of a group of women who followed Jesus Christ. This is what the Gospel of Luke says. She was there at the crucifixion of Jesus. She was there when he rose from the dead, and she was also the first to see him resurrected. It's important to note that nowhere in the Bible is Mary Magdalene described as a prostitute. It's not even clear where the misinterpretation came from. Mary was by no means a sinner. In the Gospel of Mary, discovered in Egypt and ignored by the church, she's interpreted as his wife. Not all early Christians believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Many thought Jesus Christ had survived and fled, perhaps as far away as Japan. Mary Magdalene fled as well, carrying Jesus' unborn baby in her womb. To escape persecution and protect her child, she fled to France. This is where the myth starts to become less believable and more like a legend. Mary supposedly took the Holy Grail with her to France. The Holy Grail was the cup that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper. When she arrived in Marseille, the cup was lost. Mary Magdalene then gave birth to Jesus' child. Thus, the blood of Christ lived on. Because Mary was understood to be the secret wife of the Son of God, she received fantastic treatment in France. You can't have a more famous father-in-law than God. Her lineage continued after her death, and her sons became the first kings of the Merovingian dynasty. The church learned of this and began trying to take down the Merovingians. Their efforts were supposedly behind the successful assassination of King Dagobert II in 679 AD, but the assassination didn't wipe out the bloodline entirely. It continued to flow into the Carolingians and is still believed to be around today. People could be walking across Europe right now with the blood of Christ in their veins. Number 5. Zoroastrianism and the Apocalypse Part 2 A common misconception about the biblical apocalypse is that the world will end. But it won't. The Bible says the world will be restored to its original state when God first made it. The Christian story of the apocalypse ends with all the evil of the world being destroyed, with the righteous living in paradise. For Ashokareti, the Zoroastrian apocalypse ends in the exact same way. Evil is abolished and only the righteous are left alive. But if you're not convinced that the Bible copied Zoroastrianism, even after what I told you earlier, this next revelation will surely change your mind. In the Bible, the apocalypse comes after the seven seals are broken. Jesus Christ returns, then Jesus opens the seals to unleash the judgment of God and the horrifying string of apocalyptic events. In the Zoroastrian version of the Bible, a book called the Avesta, something similar happens. The Seosient, which is the savior of humanity, resurrects all the people who have ever died. Then comes the judgment through the ordeal. It's not as long and as complex as the ordeal in the biblical apocalypse. What I mean is that there are no plagues or horsemen. But still, Frasher Caretti wouldn't be the best Saturday night. The Avesta says all the hills and mountains will turn into molten metal and create a vast river of boiling death. Everyone who ever lived will be forced across the river, which I forgot to mention flows into hell. Those who lived righteous lives will easily pass across the river to salvation. The rest will be burned and carried down to hell. All in all, it's a bad day for the sinners. 
Instead of seven seals, Thrasher Coretti has the seven divine entities known as Amesha Spenta. These entities perform a final act of worship to Ahura Mazda, ending the apocalypse. Since the righteous survived the trip across the burning river, they are the only ones left. The world is then transformed into the paradise it was always meant to be. Humans will never have to eat again, never be thirsty, and never need weapons. Everyone will speak a single language and, well, that's pretty much it. That's the end of time in a nutshell. Number 4. The Nehushtan The Bible says that Moses had a special staff that he wielded while leading the Israelites through the desert. You've likely seen images of Moses holding up his staff as he parts the Red Sea. But what most people don't realize is that on his staff was a serpent. Moses' staff was mounted with a metal serpent called Nehushtan. Moses made the serpent at the command of God as a way to cure the Israelites of snake bites while they spent 40 years wandering the eternal sands. But wait a minute, aren't serpents evil in the Bible? The serpent was the one who tempted Eve, getting her and Adam kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So why would God tell Moses to put a symbol of evil on his staff? It's because the symbolism of a serpent as an agent of healing goes way back in time. In Roman mythology, the serpent was a symbol of medicine. It was also a symbol of medicine in Greece, with the serpent being affixed to the healer god Asclepius' staff. Moses' staff was a blatant rip-off of Asclepius, who was called Aesculapius in Rome. Snakes have been symbols of healing since even before ancient Greece. Cultures in Mesopotamia saw serpents as beings of fertility. There were snake cults that existed specifically to praise the slithery serpents that twisted through the sand and the grass. As early as the 13th century BC in Sumer, the symbol of a snake or of two snakes wrapped around a pole signified healing and blessings. The serpent is still a symbol of healing to this very day. The next time you see an ambulance pass by, look for the symbol of the pole with two snakes wrapped around it. The symbol of health workers everywhere is the modern version of Moses' staff, or of Asclepius' staff, or of the staff seen on crumbling stone walls in the ruins of Sumerian cities. They're all the same thing. Number 3. The Strongest Man Who was the strongest man of the ancient world? I can't read your mind, but I have a hunch you're going to answer with one of two names. The strongest man of antiquity was either Hercules or Samson. But what if these two epic figures were the same? Not only were they both incredibly strong, but their stories are also very similar. Samson was born when a woman who couldn't conceive was visited by a mysterious angel. Hercules was born when Zeus visited his mother Alchemini. Both characters had divine conceptions. Both were rugged men, often pictured as bearded and scruffy. Samson was especially barbaric because as a Nazarite, he refused to cut his hair or trim his beard. Hercules was also a primal man covered in tangles of hair. I think some people still really dig that kind of thing. Strength is where Hercules and Samson find the most common ground. But which one was stronger? In the Bible, Samson killed 1,000 Philistines with nothing but a donkey's jawbone. On the other hand, Hercules defeated the Hydra and rescued the Princess of Troy from a rampaging sea monster. And weirdly enough, both heroes defeated a lion with their bare hands. Samson killed a beastly lion in Timnah, while Hercules slayed the Nemean lion as one of his twelve labors. Both men had failed marriages, though not for the same reasons. Samson killed thirty Philistines in a rage when he found out that his wife was given to another man by her father. Hercules lost his wife because Hera, the wife of Zeus, put a spell on him. Hercules went temporarily insane, exploding in a violent rampage that left his wife Megara slain. Hercules didn't mean to do it. It was all Hera's fault. Both he and Samson lost their wives to circumstances beyond their control. This is where the huge difference comes into play. When Samson lost his wife, he reacted with anger and animal abuse. He set 300 foxes on fire and unleashed them in the fields of the Philistines to burn them down. Hercules, on the other hand, was a little more level-headed. He asked the god Apollo to punish him for his inhuman actions. Maybe the characters found inspiration in one another when they were being written. There are a lot of scholars who think the archetype strongman from ancient myths came from a real hero who lived during the Stone Age. Number 2. The Trinity In the Gospel of John, there's a passage that reads, There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. 
It's this passage that gives us the Holy Trinity as it's known today, except the three parts of the Trinity are usually the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Word of God. What you might find interesting is that the idea of a Holy Trinity dates back to long before God sent His only Son to be the Savior of humanity. The concept is so popular it has a name, tritheism. Throughout ancient history, divinity has largely been composed of three major entities. Take Hinduism, for instance. The Hindu trinity consists of Brahma, who is the creator god. Then there is Vishnu, the preserver. And lastly, Shiva, the destroyer. These three deities must work together to maintain the harmony and balance of the universe. Creation cannot exist without destruction, so Brahma needs Shiva and Shiva needs Brahma. At the same time, Vishnu is the balance that holds the two divergent forces together. The Greek religion had Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades as the trinity. They represented heaven, the sea, and the underworld. There are almost too many examples for me to tell you about today. I'll leave you with the Roman goddess Diana. Starting around the 6th century BC, she became known as the Three-Formed Goddess. She was a triple entity representing the Divine Huntress, the Moon Goddess, and the Goddess of the Underworld. Number 1. The Garden of Pandora People use the phrase, open Pandora's box all the time, but do you actually know what it means? The phrase is used as a way to say that someone is opening up a box of chaos. The real story behind Pandora and her box of evil comes from Greek mythology. Pandora and Eve are one in the same. The stories are so inherently similar that it's difficult not to see them as the same person. Both of them were tricked into letting evil into the world and dooming all of humanity. Pandora, like Eve, was the first human woman in the world. She was created at the instruction of Zeus, just as Eve was created by God. Only Pandora was technically made by the hands of Hephaestus, the Greek god of the forge and blacksmiths. But unlike Eve, Pandora was not made just to be a companion to man. Instead, Zeus had her created as a punishment. Just before she was made, Prometheus had stolen the fire from Mount Olympus and had given it to the human men. This was such a horrible crime that Zeus chained Prometheus to a stone and had birds rip out his innards every day. Then at night, Prometheus' insides grew back only to be eaten again the next day. Even though this seems to me like a pretty sufficient punishment, Zeus wasn't satisfied. He ordered Hephaestus to create Pandora as she was being made, each of the gods gave her a unique gift. Aphrodite gifted Pandora with femininity, and Athena taught her the art of crafts. But not all of the gifts were good. For example, Hermes gave Pandora the gift of deceit and curiosity. Once she was created, Pandora was carried down from Olympus by Hermes and was given to Epimetheus, Prometheus' brother. Pandora was to be his wife, the very first wife in the world. But Pandora didn't arrive by herself. She also had a box. The gods told Pandora that the box contained very special gifts. However, she wasn't allowed to open the box. Pandora had this incredibly enticing box that supposedly contained greatness, but she wasn't allowed to open it. It didn't seem fair, just as it wasn't fair that Eve had all sorts of delicious fruit right in front of her, but wasn't allowed to eat any of it. Eventually, Pandora's curiosity got the better of her, and she opened the box. As she opened the box, it unleashed hardship, sickness, death, and all manner of terrible things into the world. Similarly, when Eve ate the forbidden fruit, evil, treachery, and lies came into the world. The gods of Olympus had locked the negative things inside the box and had given them to Pandora because Zeus knew she wouldn't be able to resist. It had been a trick from the very beginning. Shame on Zeus! It was punishment meant to blight all of humanity for being given the fire from Prometheus. The one thing that didn't get out of the box was hope. Pandora got so scared by the evil spirits flying from the box that she slammed it shut, sealing hope inside. This was also part of Zeus's design. He wanted people to suffer so that they would learn to not disobey their gods. The stories of Eve and Pandora are eerily similar, but each one has its own unique flair. They both revolve around the first woman unleashing evil into the world. Ancient authors seemed obsessed with blaming all their problems on women from the very beginning. The one thing I didn't mention is that Pandora's story wasn't plagiarized from the Bible. In fact, it's believed that the Old Testament story of Genesis may have been written a little bit earlier. Pandora's story was written by Hesiod in 700 BC, whereas Genesis was written between 1400 and 400 BC. But the truth is that nobody knows who came first, Eve or Pandora.
Which story do you prefer, the tale of Pandora's box or the myth of Adam and Eve? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. The Roman Curia The Roman Curia isn't exactly a secret, but it's certainly not something the Vatican advertises openly. In fact, most people don't even know the Roman Curia exists. Some call them the Curia Romanae, some simply the Curia. But whatever name you like the most, they're still the cabinet that looks over all the official business in the Vatican. They are, in essence, the Vatican's government. If the Pope is the President, the Roman Curia is the Senate. There are nine main departments known as congregations, the oldest of which was founded in 1542. It's called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and it was originally the office of the Inquisition. Almost 500 years later, their mission remains exactly the same. They are charged with safeguarding the religious doctrine and maintaining the orthodoxy of the Church. Each department handles something very specific. Some oversee liturgy, some are responsible for the canonization of saints, and some choose the new bishops. But the Roman Curia is much deeper than just a couple of different congregations. There are also tribunals, like the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Penitentiary, responsible for the forgiveness of sin. And finally, there are many offices and three secretaries for promoting Christian unity, for non-Christians, and for non-believers. Several enduring directives reflect papal direction for scholarly studies. They include the Pontifical Commission for Biblical Studies and the Pontifical Commission for the Revision of the Code of Canon Law. The Vatican may look like a simple organization of the top Catholic brass, but the entire structure is a very real government, one which pulls a lot of unseen strings in the world. The King Pope the Pope isn't merely a man who occasionally says things out of a very tall window, he's actually the king of his own country. He's the leader of the smallest nation in the world, the head of government and the supreme leader, the all-powerful monarch of Vatican City. This is something not many people know, that Vatican City is itself by definition an independent country. One reason the Vatican doesn't keep the public educated on its official origins is that they're kind of uncertain. Back in 1929, the Vatican made a deal with the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. This was the tyrant who went to war against the world on Hitler's side, trying to recreate the Roman Empire. Until 1871, Italy was divided into a bunch of different states. One of them was the Papal Lands, covering a massive third of Italy, and it was ruled by the Pope. When Italy finally became a country, the Pope lost a huge amount of territory and his power started to dwindle. This obviously didn't sit well with the rulers of the Vatican, as they had been enjoying pretty much unquestionable power for centuries. On February 11, 1929, the Lateran Treaty was signed by Mussolini and Pope Pius XI. The treaty was a kind of mutually beneficial deal for the two parties. The Vatican would stay out of the political decisions of Italy, and Italy would have absolutely no power over the Vatican because it would finally be an independent country. This worked out well for Mussolini when Italy went to war with the fascists, and the Pope had to stay silent about the politics of the war, otherwise he could lose control of his fine kingdom. Much of Vatican City is concealed by walls and difficult to enter as a non-citizen or invited guest. If you manage to step onto St. Peter's Square, you will be in the smallest country in the world. To really get inside the Vatican borders and visit the Vatican Museum, you won't have to deal with immigration officers, but you will have to go through tight security. The Vatican Economy Nobody knows exactly how much money the Vatican has, but we know that it's a lot. The smallest country in the world has one of the largest impacts on the global financial system out of any other governing body. Investments, private enterprise, banking deals, real estate, and so much more. The economy of the Vatican is wildly complicated and hugely secret. It also has a lot to do with the Pope himself or the Holy See. Seeing as he is the ruler of Vatican City, he's the one who technically controls all their money. The church's revenue is generated from something called Peter's Pence, which was a term that came around in the 8th century. From individual people and churches all across the globe, the Holy See collects its cash through donations. 
every time someone puts a bit of money in a donation box, that money goes directly under the Pope's control. The Pope then takes this money that's been donated to the church and delegates it to be invested. The investment portfolio is spread between stocks and bonds. Western European currencies and real estate are also held within the portfolio. The church is even active in the New York Stock Exchange. There are some investment opportunities that the Holy See won't make. For example, it will not make investments in businesses that go against church values, such as pharmaceutical companies that manufacture birth control. In this regard, the Holy See's investment strategy is similar to those that employ a faith-based investing policy. Treasure in the Dungeon According to some experts in ancient history, biblical treasure stolen from Jerusalem's Second Temple by the Romans in the year 70 could be hidden underneath the Vatican to this very day. These mysterious treasures could be held in a secret vault inside the Vatican dungeons, away from prying eyes and kept totally secret. We already know the Vatican is home to one of the most spectacular collections of historical texts anywhere in the world. There are over 35,000 volumes of mysterious information spread across 53 miles, 85 kilometers of shelves inside their secret archives. But according to Tom Meyer, a biblical studies professor from California, there could be actual treasure stashed away underneath the Vatican, not just paper and secrets. This treasure was pillaged from Judea after the Roman Emperor Titus slaughtered roughly one million Jewish people. The Romans torched the great religious buildings in Jerusalem and stole all the artifacts. And while we don't know for sure, it makes sense that those artifacts could have, over time, found their way into the powerful hands of the Vatican. And if so, they certainly might have been stashed underground in a hidden vault, a place that's legitimately secret, somewhere you won't typically hear about in an internet video. The Vatican Murders On May 4, 1998, Alois Esterman and his wife Gladys Meza Romero were killed in their apartment where they lived in Vatican City. Alois had been the newly commissioned commander of the famous Swiss Guard, appointed to his position just a few hours before his death. He was killed by a gunshot wound to the face. As for his wife, a native of Venezuela, she was killed by a bullet through her chest. But these weren't the only bodies discovered in the apartment. There was also the alleged perpetrator, a guardsman by the name of Cedric Tornay, who had died from a gunshot wound to the head. The day after the incident, the supreme seller of Vatican truths came before the media and told them what happened. They said that an internal investigation revealed Cedric Tornay had been upset with Alois Esterman. Alois was his superior, and he had disciplined him for leaving Vatican City one night without permission. Because of this disciplinary action, Cedric was not awarded a Medal of Merit. Angry about the entire ordeal, he killed Alois and his wife, then turned the gun on himself. But this is just what the Vatican says. The truth is that they never brought in the Italian law enforcement. They also didn't wait for forensic results or an autopsy. It was almost as if they had already come up with a story to tell the news beforehand. Investigations later on proved that Alois Esterman had some pretty deep connections in the Vatican, and it was rumored there were some who didn't want him climbing any higher up the ladder. Whatever the case, this murder mystery was technically solved by the Vatican less than 24 hours after it happened. It's just that, over 20 years later, few people believe the official story. What do you think happened in that apartment? Let me know in the comments. Remember to hit the subscribe button before the end of the video. Blessed are the poor. Peter's Pence is the tradition from the 8th century when all Catholics are instructed to donate to the church. Often the donations are advertised as going towards something charitable. It's like when a fast food joint asks you to donate one dollar to some children's charity. But that gut instinct telling you the money isn't going where they're saying may not be wrong. In 2019, journalists broke the case of the Vatican misappropriating funds wide open. A Wall Street Journal investigation found out that as little as 10% of donations that are specifically advertised as going towards charitable work reach those in need. The other 90% of the cash goes to the church, which is then used to budget the Vatican's deficit. This was a pretty big blow to the Pope when the news broke. Basically, churches all over the world ask people for money to help the poor. But instead of giving all the money that they collect to those poor people, they use some of the money to keep the electricity on in their churches. 
But how else is a church supposed to pay the bills other than donations? What do you think? The Pope's Swiss Guard. In the year 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V had just conquered the French, but he had a major problem. Charles didn't have enough money to pay his army of 34,000 standing men. The soldiers were furious, and so they started to march on Rome. These soldiers wanted payment, and they were going to get it by sacking and pillaging the Papal States. On May 6, 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor's underpaid Imperial Army looted Rome and caused havoc inside the city for 12 days. The only defense Rome had was the city's 5,000-man strong militia and 189 members of the Pope's Swiss Guard. The last stand was made at the Vatican, and every last defender of Rome died, except for 40 Swiss Guards who made it their duty to escort Pope Clement VII to safety. Even though the Vatican was defeated, the Imperial Army was utterly torn to shreds. While that many deaths seem like a disturbing loss for the Swiss Guards, consider that the elite unit crushed the fighting force of the Imperial Army by three quarters. Of the 20,000 troops that stormed the city of Rome, 15,000 were killed or injured by the city's guardians. Basically, the Pope's warriors turned out to be even tougher than Leonidas's 300 Spartans. A lot of property. The Pope controls not only all of Vatican City, along with who knows how many investment properties across the world, but the Church also owns some pretty unexpected pieces of property. For example, the Holy See owns the Scala Sancta, a set of 28 marble steps that lead up to the Lateran Basilica in Rome. Catholics believe these are the stairs that Jesus walked in Jerusalem as he went to his trial. The fact that the Holy See owns such an important religious sanctuary is pretty major, but that's not all. The Church also owns the Apostolic Palace, a massive chunk of real estate in Italy, and the old residence of Emperor Domitian. In 1596, the Pope had the property purchased, and it's been used as a vacation home for the leaders of the Vatican ever since. The place is gorgeous, and pretty much only used when one of the Popes wants to take a bit of a break. But perhaps the weirdest thing the Church owns is the Mount Graham International Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. For an organization that long ago persecuted scientists and killed anyone willing to discuss the intricacies of the universe, it might seem a little weird for them to own their very own observatory. The Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope was completed in 1993, and the observatory is still one of the leading astrological sites in the United States of America. I suppose the Church had a change of heart about science and the universe. Major crime. One thing you won't see in the Vatican brochures is their crime rate. As the smallest country in the world, the Vatican has one of the highest crime rates per capita. If you look at the figures, the Vatican is the most dangerous place to go for non-violent crimes. Yet, how can this be when the Vatican is home to only about 1,000 residents, most of which are nuns and priests for the Catholic Church? Well, it's all about the tourists. There are about 18 million visitors who cross the border into Vatican City each year. And because there are so many tourists, you can expect there to be heaps of crime. The Vatican has a crime rate of about 1 to 1.5 crimes committed per person every year. What that means is that, on average, every person who visits the Vatican is going to commit at least one or one and a half crimes. And while that may sound scary, the truth is that it's really just a lot of pickpockets and minor criminals shoplifting and stealing wallets. According to Crime and Punishment Worldwide, roughly 90% of these crimes are never prosecuted. Tons of gold. The International Business Times reported in 2014 that the Vatican had somewhere around $20 million in gold reserves being kept in the US Federal Reserve. That's a lot of gold for the church to be holding onto. But gold is hardly where the money's at these days. Besides all that priceless yellow, the Vatican has about $764 million in equity across their accounts, and they manage somewhere around $64 billion in global assets. The Vatican is also rumored to have a large store of gold reserve throughout the world, kept in various countries for safekeeping. We don't know exactly how much gold the Vatican has, but it's certainly more than most people are hiding in their jewelry boxes. Considering their gold reserves, the countless artifacts they have that are basically giant gold blocks, and whatever else they're keeping stashed away, 
Most experts believe they have about $50 million in total worth of solid gold. Even if the banking systems fail globally, the Vatican will still be filthy rich because of its gold reserves. They've been stockpiling the stuff for about 2,000 years. It's less difficult now to locate information about the Vatican's funds, thanks to recent reforms made by the Pope concerning the Vatican's finances, but the evidence is still not easy to come by. One thing we know for sure is, the Vatican has tons of gold. Which of these wild Vatican secrets shocked you the most? The Horus Theory Historians and scholars have noted that the story of Jesus appears to be a retelling of an earlier story told in Egypt. In the ancient religion of the Egyptians, their god was conceived by a virgin named Mary, who had the support of her husband, the child's stepfather, Seb. This messiah was born inside of a cave, his birth was announced by an angel, and it was heralded by a star and even attended by a couple of important shepherds. His life between 12 and 30 is a complete mystery, as the ancient Egyptian texts don't say much about it. Once he turned 30, things got exciting. He was baptized in a river. The person who baptized him wound up losing their head. He had 12 disciples, he performed miracles, exercised a couple of demons, raised the person from the dead, and took a stroll across the water. If you think I'm talking about Jesus, I'm not. I could, however, continue with the similarities. The Egyptian god Horus is the one I'm talking about, and he was called the Holy Child, the ever-becoming Son, the Truth, the Light, and the Way. He was Word made flesh, the Father, and the Lamb of God. He was also crucified, buried for three days, and then resurrected, and his story was told thousands of years before the story of Jesus Christ. At least, this is what the conspiracy theorists say. The truth is a little more obscure. Certain texts say Horus only actually had four disciples, that he wasn't technically baptized, and that he was never born in a cave. He did perform miracles, though. The hard truth is that Jesus and Horus do have a lot of similarities, but the Vatican has done their best through the centuries to make sure people don't know about them. The Gregorian Egyptian Museum In the year 1839, Pope Gregory XVI founded the Gregorian Egyptian Museum. The museum consists of nine rooms filled to the brim with ancient Egyptian artifacts, most of which had once been held in the private apartment of Pope Pius IV, where he'd lived in the Belvedere Palace. As you may already know, Romans were absolute fiends when it came to Egyptian anything. They loved the artwork, the statues, and even the mummies. And so, it should come as no surprise that the popes of Rome hoarded all the Egyptian relics that they could. In fact, the major importation of relics from Egypt began around the year 31 BC, after the Battle of Actium. The Roman Emperor Augustus defeated Mark Antony and his consort, Queen Cleopatra, and rich Romans drowned themselves in the spoils of war. These spoils would go on to fill the rooms of the Vatican with treasure. What this means is that, even though the Vatican opened their collection to the public in the 19th century, the relics inside are still technically spoils of war. That means they were stolen from a foreign country by a greater power, and they are still being used to make the Vatican money, far from the Egyptian people whom they technically belong to. The Vatican Obelisk there is an obelisk thousands of years old currently owned by the Vatican. You can't actually visit Vatican City without coming across the huge monument from ancient Egypt, sitting in the center of St. Peter's Square, quite literally at the heart of Vatican City. It stands erect in front of the Great Dome of St. Peter's Basilica, and most people take it for granted. They don't realize that this stolen piece of Egyptian history is not only kept prisoner by the Vatican, but has also been defaced by the Christian cross affixed to its top. That part wasn't there when the Egyptians first built the thing. So then, how in the world did this piece of Egypt wind up being stolen by the Vatican, who refused to give it back? Well, they didn't consider it stealing back in the year 37 AD. The famous Roman Emperor Caligula took the obelisk from Egypt as a prize and brought it to Rome. And it wasn't the only one. There are approximately 13 obelisks standing through the city. There are more Egyptian obelisks in Rome than there are in Egypt. Unfortunately, the history of the obelisks is mostly lost. The one in Vatican City has no hieroglyphs on it, 
and so we don't have any information about which pharaoh ordered its construction. All we really know is that it showed up in Alexandria about 2,000 years ago, was brought to Rome, and has been standing erect in the same spot ever since. It was originally put in Caligula's garden, then moved to the square, and it hasn't moved an inch since then. The Forbidden Teachings of Jesus the oldest known copy of a mysterious text detailing the teachings of Jesus Christ is not hiding in the Vatican. This ancient piece of Christian history was actually discovered in an Egyptian trash dump. It was found with some other scraps of paper from the 5th century, some tax receipts and a bill of sale for a wagon and some donkeys. This is a very rare religious manuscript, written in the Greek language. It's a piece from a story that was never included in the Bible, called The First Apocalypse of James. If you've ever heard of the lost or forbidden books of the Bible, this is one of them. The story is considered apocryphal, and so not biblical canon. Instead of being one of the biblical stories written over 3,000 years ago, this one was very likely only written about 1,500 years ago. The Vatican, or the Roman Catholic Church in general, does not consider it to be any kind of religious scripture. Still, it is a hugely important religious text. According to expert Brent Landor, the manuscript was written in Greek because in the days of the Romans, Greek was universal. It was the English of 2,000 years ago. Brent also says the manuscript was probably used as a teaching device because of the way each line is separated by small dots, and because of how the syllables are all divided. It looks like a tool that would have been used by a teacher to help students learn how to read and write Greek. This would have been a major issue, because at the time the Catholic Church had forbidden this text. It was banned, and you could get in serious trouble for having it in your possession. Still, this teacher was apparently defiant and obsessed with the story of the first apocalypse of James. The book describes the world as a prison created by an evil god, a kind of first century version of the Matrix. Fake Mummies there are two mummies being kept by the Vatican. According to the Smithsonian Institution, these mummies are fakes. Researchers say the Vatican's mummies are nothing but replicas from the 19th century, during a time when Europe was consumed by mummy mania. This rather peculiar discovery came to light when researchers were studying the collection of mummies at the Vatican. They found two of them to be quite abnormal. They were both under 2 feet 0 0.6 meters long, and supposedly held either the remains of mummified children or ancient mummified falcons. When the researchers tested the DNA of the bones, they discovered them to be from a man and a woman who lived in the Middle Ages. In other words, these were people from no more than 500 years ago, who most likely had their bodies stolen from their graves. Then they were wrapped in fake mummy wrappings. They've been on display for centuries, and the Vatican never even realized it the remains of Alexander the Great. The Catholic Church, aka the leaders of the Vatican, might actually be hiding the remains of one of the most legendary men in history. There is a theory out there that says Alexander the Great's body is being kept a secret by the Vatican, and they don't want anyone else to get a hold of his bones. This theory says that after Alexander's death in 323 BC, he was buried somewhere in a tomb in Alexandria, Egypt. After his burial, a Venetian merchant stole his corpse and transferred it to Italy. The corpse was then misidentified as St. Mark the Evangelist and buried in St. Mark's Basilica. The theory is pretty wild, and there isn't much proof that it's actually true. If these people are to be believed, it's actually Alexander the Great's body at the Basilica, not St. Mark. It would explain why Alexander's tomb has never been found, even though people have been searching for it for thousands of years. That's actually the only aspect that makes sense. After Alexander died of unknown causes, he was buried in Memphis, Egypt. A couple of decades later, his body was moved to Alexandria. All the most powerful leaders of the ancient world came through the centuries to pay respect at his tomb. Everybody knew where it was, and so it doesn't make sense that it could have been so easily lost. It does make a little sense if his body was stolen, brought to Italy, and then mislabeled as the corpse of a saint. The Knowledge of Alexandria In the 3rd century BC, the Great Library of Alexandria was supposedly the biggest repository for knowledge in the ancient world. 
It was a center for learning, where scholars from all over the known world came to be enlightened and to study. The library supposedly opened during the reign of Ptolemy I after Alexander the Great died. The primary function of the library was to gather together every piece of knowledge on earth to form the ultimate depot of human wisdom. Unfortunately, the library was destroyed about 2,000 years ago. We still don't really know why, only that the Library of Alexandria was completely gone by the year 400 AD. Some say it was a lack of government funds that led to its degradation, then it was burned by the Muslims. There's another theory that says it was actually the Christians who destroyed the library because it went against their beliefs. Some believe that other pagans destroyed this famous library. Between 48 and 47 BC, Julius Caesar was entangled in a civil war. Ancient sources say he actually set fire to his own ships and that the fire spread to shore, destroying the library and everything close to it. Here's where things get really suspicious. There actually isn't any archaeological evidence showing a huge library in Alexandria. There are some ancient remains, but they only would have been able to hold about 70,000 books. Researchers say there's no way the library had contained even a small portion of all the world's texts. Still, there are some experts who truly believe it was the Christians who destroyed the library, and that they even took some of the most important books of wisdom with them. These books are supposedly stashed in the Vatican archives. The Pyramid in Rome The Pyramid of Cestius is the only pyramid in Rome. It's not technically in Vatican City, but it does have a pretty similar history to the Vatican obelisk. The Romans didn't pick the pyramid up and bring it with them, but instead stole the Egyptian style. In the year 30 BC, the Roman Empire absolutely decimated Egypt. Within a couple of years, the Romans were helplessly obsessed with everything Egyptian, and in 18 BC, the Pyramid of Cestius began construction. It took only a year for the Romans to build it as a burial monument for a man named Gaius Cestius Apulo. He was a praetor, meaning he was extremely important, and the tomb pyramid was way smaller than he'd wanted it to be. During this particular time in Roman history, there was a very specific law which regulated gratuitous displays of wealth. People couldn't hold feasts that were too big, they couldn't wear clothing that was too luxurious, and they couldn't build giant pyramids that overshadowed all the other buildings in the city. There was once a bigger pyramid in Rome called the Pyramid of Romulus, and it stood between the Vatican and the Mausoleum of Hadrian. However, Pope Alexander VI ordered the ancient pyramid to be demolished in the 16th century, then used its broken pieces to help build the steps of St. Peter's Basilica. The Greatest Treasures The Great Egyptian Museum at the Vatican is home to some of the most bizarre and most important artifacts in the world. For example, there's the statue of Anubis, the Egyptian god of mummification, decorated in a Roman toga. This fine marble statue comes from the first century AD, a time when the Romans had started adopting many of the Egyptian gods. The statue is an example of how Anubis became merged with the Roman god Mercury. In one hand, he holds an Egyptian musical instrument called a sistrum, and in the other holds the caduceus of Hermes, which the god Hermes used to guide souls in both Greek and Roman mythology. This statue, although clearly Egyptian-inspired, actually came from Rome and was donated to Pope Benedict XIV in 1749. Mummifying Saints The Vatican is harboring an extremely bizarre secret. Just like how the Romans copied the Egyptian gods 2,000 years ago, the Vatican is planning on copying Egyptian burial techniques. The top brass over at the Vatican are eagerly experimenting with mummifying their saints. This isn't a conspiracy theory, just something the Vatican would probably rather not talk about. We know that underneath the Vatican is the preserved corpse of John XXIII, who looks just as good as he did when he died in 1963. He's entombed in a glass coffin and doesn't look a day over a hundred. His preservation was inspired by the ancient Egypt mummification process. Between 1975 and 2008, a team of elite Vatican embalmers preserved approximately 31 saints and important servants of God. It's all part of the Catholic belief that says if a body doesn't decay after death, the person is indisputably holy. 
Apparently, it doesn't matter if the incorruptibility is artificial or not. The Vatican has a poor history of trying to mummify their corpses. When Pope Pius XII died in 1958, the Vatican tried to preserve him in the same way that Jesus was preserved after he died, using a kind of mummy wrapping. They wrapped him up, but it was a huge failure. His nose fell off and the stench was so sick that one of the guards fainted because of it. And still, all these years later, the Vatican is attempting to mummify anyone of great importance. Do you think the Vatican should still be mummifying saints? Let me know your thoughts on this bizarre news in the comments. And thanks for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe and come back soon for more awesome videos. Bye.